Hey everyone. Starting this event, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional, ancestral, and stolen territory of the Coast Salish peoples, Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I say stolen because if we were convinced by colonial capitalism, economic strategies that is possible to claim and own land, then we were scammed by an oppressive strategy that puts body against body, identity against identity, worker against worker, one generation after the other. I invite us to reflect on what it means to live within colonial capitalist structures, our relationship with class consciousness, land owning, identity politics, and decolonizing knowledge. We say messy arts is a space by and for over excluded voices to recognize that there is a scheme of silences and voids of thought that enables us, the people, to discuss and deeply understand the narratives that have built this place that we commonly call North America. Tonight, messy art society and artists Jyoti Kasaman and Firuzi Bitigara welcome our audience for my petals are bruised and I'm still a flower, an night of art, performance, and healing that brings together queer disabled artists. This project has been made possible by the government of Canada. And Jyotika is a queer, disabled, interdisciplinary artist, community organizer, social worker, and expressive arts therapist. She's deeply passionate about the arts as a profound and powerful tool to support a coming back into our bodies. Her storytelling uses various art mediums that she weaves into one another, collaging, painting, singing, and poetry. Kiruzi is a queer, disabled, and chronically used South Asian writer and authenticity coach, specializing in helping queer and trans BIPOC to stop living in the shoes and to live in their truth. As a storytelling coach, she works with BIPOC to feel empowered to tell their stories. She has published in various anthologies and is currently working on her memoir. Now, please help me welcome Jotika. Hello, everyone. Hello. How is everyone doing? Good. <laughs> okay. Better. <sighs> now I can land and see everyone and look in the room. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for showing up and participating in this event. Um, I have a little welcome that I've written down. Um, yeah, this event is called My Petals Are Bruised and I'm Still a Flower. And that's referencing a song by Alison Russell, who is an amazing queer, Black activist, writer, musician. Look her up, she's incredible. Um, and I felt that that aligned with what we were wanting to talk about today and wanting to explore as brown, disabled, queer artists. Um, spring is here. How are we feeling about that? The spring is here, it's arrived, it's warm, it's raining right now, but you know, spring is still here. That's typical. <laughs> we'll have a few spring fake outs until the actual spring. But oh, for me, it feels feels really good. And I know that I feel like my seasonal affective disorder, my sad has lifted a little bit. And just, I'm just, I've got my regular depression now. <laughs> Not the layers. So, even though I'm saying that, I do feel better. Things are feeling lighter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can anyone relate? Yes. <laughs> the world is still a really hard place to live in. <laughs> and things are really hard, and we're still folks are really disabled still. Um, I'm going way off my script, but that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I wrote um, here on the West Coast, Musqueam, Squamish, Lilitude lands. The barometric pressures have been low. The days have been wet and rainy and cloudy. And it's that sort of cold that goes into your bones and everything hurts and you're like, why, why do I live here? <laughs> so that's lifted a little bit, even though it's a little cold today and it will continue to be cold. 
for a bit longer. That that deep cold I feel has is lifting and, and leaving us. And I'm really grateful for that because that means spring and that means flowers and that means summer. <laughs> summer will eventually come. <laughs> oh. As a person who lives in the intersections of many identities, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> As a person who lives in the intersections of many identities, it's just another thing that we deal with in terms of, I'm sorry. <laughs> I went off track and now what that, that line doesn't make sense. <laughs> so just give me a second, let me gather my thoughts. <laughs> you got this. You got this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm grateful that everyone's wearing masks and I'm very hot and sweaty inside the mask. Uh -huh. One of the things, one of the things I deal with is eczema. And so my face gets hot and I get hives and it gets itchy. So bear with me, I might take some sips of water. <laughs> so yeah, we talked about spring here. We talked about summer coming and we talked about sad dissipating and regular depression just sitting and where we're at now. So yeah, I really I wanted to create this night to bring folks together in person and virtually. I hope the virtual is going okay and that folks can hear us. Please let us know if you can and we will try to remedy that. Um, I wanted to bring folks together and just talk about what COVID has been like for queer brown folks lives, like what it has been like and what isolation has done to folks and what we can do to break that isolation and what we can do to come back together again. And knowing that like a lot of folks are still really isolated and really, you know, kind of stuck in their homes. I was thinking about the many folks that I invited today and a bunch of folks were like, I'm too sick, I can't come. I'm gonna attend virtually. And then I had some friends too that were like, I'm too sick, I can't even attend virtually. So <coughs> folks, oh. Folks are, folks are sick. And like a lot of people in my, our communities are just dealing with their regular disabled lives, their regular illnesses and things on top of COVID. So I wanted to bring folks together and see how, how are we, what are we doing? How can we be together? How can things look different? What are the things that are working? What's not working? So that's a little bit about tonight. And I really appreciate you all coming. Oh, it feels so nice. The room is full. And like almost 40 people registered for in person, which is the capacity, which is great. <laughs> Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to share that I missed. I think, I think these are the big things, yes. Oh, I'll talk about what the night will look like. So we will have two performances, myself and Fee. And then we will move the, the chairs out of the way and we will have some tables and art supplies and I'll have some prompts on the table so folks can explore through writing, through art, um, maybe your own personal journaling, whatever feels good for you to explore those prompts. And there's four questions. So I will share that afterwards and we will share for folks attending virtually, we'll share that in the chat and then you can go into breakout rooms and chat about those prompts. And then we'll come back together for the last part of the evening and we'll we'll talk. We'll talk about what we wrote, we'll talk about how we're feeling, and that'll be that. <laughs> yeah, cool. Okay, so I would like to I would like to um, invite Fee up to the stage. And before that, I'm gonna just read out her bio and talk a little bit about her. <laughs> um, so Fee is a queer, disabled, and chronically ill South Asian writer and authenticity coach. As an authenticity coach, she specializes in helping queer and trans BIPOC to stop living in the shoulds and live in their truths. As a storytelling coach, she works with BIPOC to feel empowered and to tell their story. Because our stories heal us, they heal others. In her writing, Fee explores the nuances of being queer and brown through the lenses of many places she has inhabited. She is published in various anthologies and is currently working on her memoir. She lives with her wife and their plant babies nestled between the forest and the sea on stolen Kosales lands. Welcome, Fee, to the first one with us.
Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm also going to take this off because I've been quite nauseous <laughs> today. Oh, so um, thank you first, Jessica, for this really, really sweet event. I was excited to be invited and after hearing a little bit about your intentions for it, I feel even more honored to be part of it. So thank you for being here together. And thank you, Massey, as always, for just creating this really intentional space. Um, I moved back to BC from California a couple of years ago. I was there for 14 years, and that's where I really found a lot of like BIPOC, queer, artist community. I grew up in North Van in the 90s, so none of that really felt like it was accessible. And then coming back here, it was just this stress of like, will I ever find community again? And yeah, like meeting folks at Massey and the really cool like people who do things here is always nourishing and always feels like a lifeline. So today I wanted to do something different. I usually read the pieces I've written. And today I really wanted to do some storytelling. And as soon as I decided on that, um, a couple of friends packed their bags, flew into town, and took up residence to tell me exactly what they thought of that. So I decided to invite them onto the stage to just share <laughs> the stage with me. Um, the first one is my friend Perfectionism. <laughs> I've invited her to the stage. She's wearing that, like, you know, that like striped Chanel outfit. <laughs> Like giant pearl necklace. Her hair is perfect. Her seating is like perfect. No offense to anyone who chose to sit that way. Um, <laughs> so I just invited her. She's gonna hang out with me. We've already had a lot of chats this week. <laughs> now her cousin, who I'm not new to, but Getting to know better is judgment. So judgment also really came over this week. I don't know why I feel like she's wearing this black leather outfit. <laughs> and I just like ran lipstick and this like asymmetrical, I don't know what any of this means, but so she's here too. Uh, and she's had a lot of opinions on me storytelling versus reading you something that is perfect and controlled and thought out. So I'm just gonna do that anyway. Oh, look at that. Maybe that's symbolic. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> we'll get through this together. Um, so I thought about this theme of um, the bruised petals. And the association that came to me was something that one of my meditation teachers had said this thing about like every rose has its thorns and its petals, right? And I really liked that. And when I think about the chronic illness I've had, particularly the one of a few that I've had the last few years, um, I've really worked on focusing on the petals. And that's my way of like being on the healing lane versus focusing on the thorns and the shit and like just spiraling. So that's been a very intentional thing of like stay with the things that don't super suck. <laughs> Not as a way to bypass, but as a very intentional, you know, way to keep my energies where I want them to be. So that was something I was thinking about for tonight. Um, and yes, and the other part is when I thought about the petals that have been there. I realized that for a long time, over the last few years, so while everyone else was get, getting on with COVID, I was, you know, getting on with my illness, which happened like two months before COVID, so it's been extra fun. <laughs> and throughout that time, I, um, for a lot of that time, I was spending my energy knocking on the door of specifically biofam, like biological family, being like, see me, love me, help me. And that door never really opened, right? So it's been like, where are the petals, the bright spots, the beauty? And it's not there, but it's there. Like it's not with biofam, but it's around. So I just wanna, yeah, talk about that a little today. 
So a few days before my 40th birthday, I did the perfect headstand. After 20 years of leaving yoga, I did that pyramid thing or the tra trapeze, whatever triangle thing, and then my body just lifted and I was upside down. <laughs> and I was like, this is cool. And it was this moment in my life when I had been doing a lot of those high intensity interval trainings where you like flip tires and smash ropes and throw sandbags and floor and all that. And I was doing a lot of Bollywood like Zumba because that's just fun. <laughs> And I was eating clean and I was eating green and I was really healthy. Yeah. Uh, my birthday is in January. So in December, I went to Mexico, which was my little tradition with myself. And I laid in one specific hammock every day at the beach. And I climbed this Mayan ruin and I sat at the very top at the beginning of the day. And I looked out at this, like at the top of this canopy of the forest. And I came back to California and I threw myself an amazing birthday party. Like I had some friends who were, whose spouses were throwing them the birthdays. I was like, I'm single, that's great. I'm gonna throw myself the perfect party and I did. And it was at this cafe that I used to go to all the time called Ruz because the owner's name, this Persian guy, his name was Ruz Bay, who went by Steve. <laughs> it was called Ruz and Ruz is in my name for Ruz Bay, also a Persian name. And so I threw it there and I invited like my yoga and social justice friends and my Bollywood friends and my queer gym friends and Steve and the days leading up to the birthday party would be like, Fee, I think we should have a specialty drink for your birthday. And we'll call it the Fee Mosa. And I was like, that's so cute, let's do it. And I looked around on the night of my birthday and I felt like I had arrived. Because five years before, the divorce had begun to like the brown man thing and perfect house. And I was like, no, thank you. And five years later, I built the life that I had wanted. And I looked around on my birthday. I was like, oh, this is it. Like queer coming out, check, right? Living the life I want, check. Like doing my thing, check. Making Bollywood and queerness and brownness meet up, check. <laughs> and right around that time, I started to have a pain point here and inflammation there. And a few months after that, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in such a weird way that I did not even know I had a disease. <laughs> I was just told by this very hairy doctor, like, <laughs> you should take these pills. So I didn't know I had a disease until like a year later. She never told me that. She never told me how serious it was. It felt like I was on the prices right the day I was diagnosed. She's like, behind door number one, you can have this medication. You might have liver failure. Behind door number two, this medication. I have vision loss. Behind door number I was like, oh, I think I want to keep my organs. <laughs> I'm going to do no medications. I'm going to do um, natural healing. And so a year later, on my 41st birthday, I woke up in the hospital. I had been there three days. My knee was the size of a grapefruit, and there was um, infection in it, and they couldn't figure out what it was. And so I'd been in the hospital three days already because the little in-and-out procedure that the doctor had described hadn't worked. I couldn't really walk. And I could walk before when, when I went to the hospital. And so, yeah, everything changed. And this whole being upside down during that headstand, like when your actual world turns upside down, it is not fun. And so, yeah, on, the, on my birthday, I woke up to the hospital breakfast. You know, you lift up that plastic dome and it's like French toast, but it's like got condensation on it, a shrivelly sausage. There's a card that says, happy birthday patient from the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> it's sweet and it's <laughs> And my friends had come over the night before, the same friends who had been there, you know, for my birthday the previous year. But it had this like, cocktail party kind of vibe like I was really sick and they were all like chit-chatting because I hadn't seen each other since the previous birthday so I started ghosting people that you know that day I was like okay I know I need help I don't know what kind of help I don't think it's this right like the gravity of the situation wasn't kind of going through so the first pedal that I want to tell you about is Isabel, the nurse who I had at the rehab facility that I was transferred to after the hospital. She was this Latina woman who just like 
didn't mess around and we bonded because my rehab facility was in this town that's sort of the equivalent of West Van, like old rich white people. So it was pretty bougie. It was great after that public refunded hospital went for that. And Isabella and I bonded over entitled white people, right? Like she's like, do you know what they ask me? They ask me, where are you from? And I draw a map on the whiteboard of like North America, Central America, South America. And I say, this is where I'm from. Where are you from? And I was like, Isabella, I love you. <laughs> Isabella started stealing hospital materials for me and shoving them in my backpack. She's like, you're doing it. <laughs> um, one of the days that I was there, I called uh, each of my sisters. I was like, could you maybe, like, so they're in Canada. I was like, could you maybe fly down and help me out? Because it's a little overwhelming right now. I can't really walk and I don't know how to live on my own. And one after the other, they said no. And so that moment, there was such a, like, you know, that primal, like, almost animal cry that just came out of me. And Isabel was walking past in the hallway, and she heard, and she came in, and she just, like, let me put my head on her really soft bosom. It felt so, like, motherly. And she had no idea what had happened, but it didn't matter. And she just, like, rubbed my back, and she's like, you're going to get through this, like, Jesus is going to get you through this. And I was like, it's, I don't believe in Jesus, but I don't even care because like, you're just here right now and that's so great. And she was that maternal figure I really, really needed. You know, I didn't have bio family in California, so she was really there for me. Another person who was really there, another pedal, was, as I've been thinking about it, she's like my sister who <laughs> has shown up better than my biological ones. And this is my friend, Lana. Lana? knew what to do you know when people ask like oh my gosh what do you need like i don't fucking know i'm in the hospital like pick a thing anything <laughs> so lana didn't like labor me with asking she just like sent her partner to my house once i got home with like seven individually wrapped dinners that she had made and put in like tupperware <laughs> and so she was really there for me so the following year on my birthday she spent the afternoon with me she had been cooking for me every weekend, like a week's worth of food. And she really, really showed up for me. And not only cooking, but like also taking more time to just hang out and be my buddy. And I felt so, so grateful for that. So she and I were sitting on my like Papa son one afternoon with that blessed California sun just coming into my bedroom. <laughs> I sure miss that sun. <laughs> and I told her like, hey, I met someone at this online event, but she's way too gorgeous and way too like cool to ever go out with me. Like I'm like a nerd from North Van. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but Judge Van Auntie is telling me that, right? And so Lana and I looked at um, this person's Instagram account on my phone, and I had her whole Instagram grid memorized by now. So I was like, okay, look at this photo, zoom in. <laughs> Look at this Arabic tattoo on her arm. How gorgeous is that, right? And then Lana zooms in on one photo. She's like, oh, I wonder if this is like a mole or a Monroe on her mouth or, or like on her lip or whatever. I'm like, what's a Monroe? She's like, oh, it's when you put a piercing where like Marilyn Monroe had a mole. Like, oh my God, whatever it is, if I ever meet this person, I'm going to die. That's just way too gorgeous. <laughs> so it turns out this person did like me back. <laughs> And uh, you called it so hard and so fast. <laughs> <laughs> so this was the most fucked thing i'm falling in love while my body is falling apart okay like things are just dangling in places they shouldn't be and this woman just shows up and she just accepts and she just is there during that first little while when there's a lot of touchy feelings going on right like there's my personal shame and nervousness because I'm in this very new body but she's patient as I figure out how to be on the bed and all this stuff and then there's a lot of creativity that can happen because you find new ways of touching and giving pleasure and receiving pleasure and she's there for all of it. She's there the day that the last time that I asked my sisters for help a day that I've been given a whole bunch of doctors moving back to Canada things are bad <laughs> they're like you don't have to wait a year for a specialist 
four days later, I have a team of specialists. And my person, my partner, has come with me for that whole day. So that night, I asked my sisters, could you just, one of you, just drop me off something early? This new relationship is a lot to ask someone. And one after the other, they each say no. And so my partner is there to hold my rage and hold my rants. And she's there when I decide to stop talking to them for a while. And she's there when I start talking to them again several months later because she gets that family is complicated. My partner gently walks me over to the shoppers to buy a cane because my gate is really ugly. And she walks the half block with me before I get tired and walk back home and get into bed. And then she's there when I don't need the cane anymore. And she understands when I get lost in the forest for two hours or three hours talking to the birds, <laughs> hugging the trees. And she's like, okay, she'll be back. It's okay. And she's just there through it all. The other petal is my body. The other bright spot, you know, I've been, as I wrote this piece, I was like, oh, my body has been with me throughout. I've had disabilities since I was a kid. I've been to as many international hospitals as international destinations. I've died more than one, I mean, almost died. I keep saying that I've been at death's door more than once and my body's been with me through it all. We together have walked down cobblestone streets of Paris and Rome and Lahore and South Korea. We've climbed the ruins and swum in the seas with sea turtles. And I've also railed and ranted in my body, wanting to be normal, wanting to look like everyone else and do the things like everyone else. And every time I've abandoned my body, it has not abandoned me. And at this moment, my body is just hanging out with me, being my teacher. And I think the current lesson that I'm working on is I keep going back into capitalism, right? Wanting to work the nine to five like everyone else. And my body's like, no, no, we're doing this other thing. We're trying to move to the rhythm of nature, the rhythm that's right for you, which might mean waking up at 10 or 11 in the morning. It might mean working three hours a day instead of the eight. And I remember that and then I forget that and then I remember it again. And my body's just patiently there, like, <laughs> you'll be back. <laughs> I'll bring you back, right? And so through it all, yeah, my body is the truth keeper, the truth knower, the truth seeker, and the truth speaker. Thank you. I'm going to introduce Jessica. <laughs> Jessica is a queer, disabled, chronically ill, cis fan. Her people come from northern India by way of indentureship to Fiji. She identifies as a settler on the lands she lives, the unceded, unsurrendered, stolen lands of the Musqueam. Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. She is an interdisciplinary artist, a community organizer, a social worker, and an expressive arts therapist. She is deeply passionate about the arts as a profound and powerful tool to support a coming back into our bodies. It can be an entry point, a doorway to more self-awareness of our nervous system, to creating greater connection to what safety, soothing, and connection feel like in our bodies, Art has always been a constant in her life and it has saved her many times. Creating and witnessing others' art have helped her cope with the effects of trauma, nourished and helped her survive some of the hardest times of her life. Her storytelling uses various arts mediums that she weaves into one another, collaging, painting, singing, and poetry. See more about her and her work at jopithahealingarts.com. Please welcome Jopitha. Thank 
appreciate your vulnerability and your honesty and your powerful storytelling. You weren't looking at anything and that's just, I love that. <laughs> so I, I prepared some things and I'm like, do I want to share that? I don't know. I don't know if I want to share that. I think I want to share other things. <laughs> yeah. I think I just want to share some songs and maybe some poems with folks. Yeah, I came over, came across this song on Instagram, and I was like, it doesn't sound right. It was this woman singing love to her body and like trying to manifest health and like wellness. And it was a white woman, and she was singing, and I was like, there's just something about this that feels ableist, and it doesn't really feel good. Um, so I took the tune and I rewrote the song to fit for something that just felt better for my body. Um, I'll share what she had said and then I will share my, my version of it. It's a beautiful song. I just feel like what she was singing didn't fit for me. Because it erases parts of me and I'm tired of erasing parts of me and making parts of myself smaller. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So her version. Every little cell in my body is healthy. Every little cell in my body is well. Every little cell in my body is healthy. Every little cell in my body is well. I'm so glad every little cell, every little cell in my body is well. I'm so glad every little cell, every little cell in my body is well. It's beautiful and it's nice. And I need to add some more. <laughs> so I'm in pain, don't feel okay. Every little cell in my body's okay. Hurt and sore and ache all over. Every little cell in my body is loved. I'm not okay. I'll be okay. It's okay that I don't feel well. Every little cell in my body belongs. I'm still worthy when I'm not well. Every little cell in my body is loved. Every little cell in my body is loved. Every little cell in my body is worthy. Every little cell in my body belongs. I'm in pain, don't feel okay. Every little cell in my body belongs. Hurt and sore and ache all over every little cell in my body can heal. I'm not okay, I'll be okay. It's okay that I don't feel well. Every little cell in my body belongs. I'm still worthy when I'm not well. Every little cell in my body belongs. I'm still worthy when I'm not well. Every little cell in my body is love. Every little cell in my body is love. Every little cell in my body is worthy. Every little cell in my body belongs. <laughs> Hey, 
Thank you. I like my version better. What do you think? Yeah. 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 It's more nuanced, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think it might be tolerating this person if I put really set up more of it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share a piece or two from my Zine album, um, which is a Zine I made a few years ago. And it included an album where I recorded my song poems, which are pieces of writing that I, that are songs and poems put together. <laughs> yeah. And I'm selling them at the merch table if you want to buy them <laughs> later. So this, this Zine album had um, chapters and the fifth chapter is called Shakti, which is like, I don't know how to explain it, less like, feminine energy um, and shakti and towards healing. That's what this um, chapter is called. So this is a love letter to myself. <sighs> Let's take a breath. Yeah. I feel <laughs> Sing that song. I'm like, oh, it's so vulnerable. Oh my God. <sighs> yeah. I'm here for you, sweetheart, when you need to fall apart. I'll hold all those parts of you that ache. I'm here for it. I won't ever leave you. I love you with the depth and resilience that is ancient, given to me by the ancestors. It's from a knowing that is deep roots stretched down, down into the earth, from soil that has given life to plants and food. I'm here beside you, within you. If you need to fall apart, let that little girl cry, big tears flowing, streaming down their brown body. Stories deep, let them out. I've always been here. Sometimes the overwhelm and the pain and the ancestral turmoil was louder than the magic. Chaos lived in my body. I didn't know how to feel anything other than pain, but I'm here. There isn't only pain inside of you, sweetheart. Did you know that you are full of magic? That there was never only pain inside? You are the magic. You are powerful and you are strong. Resilience lives in your blood, wisdom in your spine. The ancestors, they have your back. I have your back. I trust you and I'm proud of you and I love you. I'm here for you, sweetheart. When you need to fall the fuck apart, I'll hold all those parts of you. That ache, I'm here for it. I have your back. I trust you. I'm proud of you. And I love you. Love letter to myself. <laughs> now that I've gone completely off script. <laughs> Wild and unruly. <laughs> oh my god. Yes. Yes. It happens. It happens. <laughs> um, oh, I'll sing. Okay. I will share. So, as I was mentioning earlier, one of the conditions that I deal with is eczema. And people don't really know about eczema if you don't know eczema. If you don't know about skin disease, if you don't know about dermatitis, and they think it's like an itch and it's a rash and it's it's not very bothersome. It's very bothersome. It's very bothersome. <laughs> it really, like, eczema is intense. It's got its stages and it's, it hurts. It hurts a lot. And it's, they don't have a cure for eczema. And the reason people have eczema is like 10 million different reasons. So you kind of have to find your own um, reasons why it's happening. And recently I went to get patch testing, which is where they put like 80 allergens on your back and you have to keep them on your back for five days. Here's someone that has a disorder of itching, an itching disorder and put, five, and put 80 things on their back and then send them home and be like, don't touch it. You cannot touch it. And so I went back after day four and they took it off, but they're like, you still can't touch it. And you have to come back in three more days. And I was like, I hate you. Will this even help me? I don't know. It did, it did help me. I learned that I was severely allergic to nickel, which did you know was in food? It's in so many foods. Yeah. So 
coming up is a new journey of cutting out foods and seeing if that helps. And I'm actually feeling pretty good about it, even though it's going to be all those challenges with food stuff. But yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. Oh, it's talking about my disease now. Yeah. So I think it's interesting. I was thinking about tonight and I was thinking about my friends and I have so many friends that live with like different disabilities. And for a bunch of them, I don't actually even know what folks deal with. I don't even know like names of illnesses or even, yeah, I don't really know. I couldn't tell you what my, this friend is dealing with. And I think that that's okay. That's totally fine. Um, because I feel like as a person who's like recently come into the identity of disabled, I called myself a spoonie for a long time, called myself chronically ill for a long time. And I think within the past year, I've come to the identity as disabled. And for me, it's like just this breath of fresh air to say that I identify that way. And it's also like a permission to rest. It's permission to kind of not hold myself up to that capitalist standard of like, I can't work 40 hours a week. I haven't been able to work 40 hours a week in like years and always felt shame about it. Always was like, why am I so sick? Why, why can I, you know? And for me dealing with mental health as well as physical health things, but not necessarily having diagnosis, diagnoses. So not being able to pinpoint like what was happening. And so when I think about friends and loved ones that have illnesses, like it's fine that I don't know what exactly they deal with because I believe them. I believe that they're sick and I believe that they need rest. And it's okay if you can't come to my event, I love you and I know you care about me and you need to take care of yourself. Yeah. So that, yeah, let's just sit with that, that being able to like trust and like trust myself to be like, it's okay that I am not getting out of bed. It's a similar story of like, being so hard on myself, berating myself that I can't get out of bed and clean or do certain things because I can't, I can't get out of bed. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna read this poem about eczema that I wrote. I wrote it a long time ago. Yeah, it's called Itch, Bleed, Bleed, Itch. That's the most like intense part of the poem today. So don't worry. <laughs> lost all its meaning, external expression of what's living within, external expression of what's being held within, stagnation, imbalance. I itch and I itch and I itch and I break the skin and I bleed and it's not enough and it burns and it's not enough. I can't stop. Itch, bleed, bleed, itch. Itch, bleed, bleed, itch. How do we move the stagnation? When the cause is so heavy to move, too painful to touch, too much, too much, too hot to hold, too raw to feel, too much to take. It's to relieve, release, feel, break skin, what's within. Break skin, what's within. What's changed? Nothing, everything. How do I heal? How do I see? How do I start to feel it and unpack? My rough skin tells stories. Rough skin is tender. It doesn't take shit. I itch and I itch and I itch and I break skin and I bleed and it's not enough and it burns and it's not enough. It's never enough. I can't stop. Itch, bleed, bleed, itch. Itch, bleed, bleed, itch. Thank you. I, inspired by what he had shared, I wanted to share just like a little itty bitty song, and then that's my set for the night. Um, called Dear Body. Oh, I need some water. Dear body, sweet body. Teach me how to listen to you. Teach me how to know what to do. 
Dear body, sweet body. Teach me how to listen to you. Tell me how to know what to do. Teach me how to listen to you. Tell me how to know what to do. Dear body, sweet body. Thank you.